Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for our first Research Spotlight webinar of 2024. Happy New Year to all of you, and I hope you all enjoyed the holidays. I'm Dr. Sarah Hernandez, the Director of Research Programs at the Hereditary Disease Foundation. This is normally the part of the webinar where I introduce you all to a brilliant HD researcher who talks about their own work, but we are starting 2024 off with a bit of a different feel. So I will be the speaker today, and I am going to get to share the work of lots of other incredibly smart people sharing the history of HD research from the discovery of the gene that causes Huntington's through to ongoing clinical trials. So lots of very exciting research to cover. Uh, before we start, I want to remind everyone you can ask questions in the Q&A box throughout the talk. So that's the Q&A box, not the chat box. And I will do my best to answer as many of them as I can at the end. We should have about 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. So send your questions in as you think of them so that you don't forget. And we will address as many of those at the end as we can. Um, by way of introduction, my journey into HD research began when I was a kid. I found out that HD runs in my family, and that led to a whole lot of questions for which I did not have answers, which ultimately led me to a career in research. So I spent over 15 years working at the lab bench before more recently moving to the Hereditary Disease Foundation. So today I will be sharing a historical perspective of the HD research field, that brings us to modern day. So essentially the story of HD research, history and hope. Um, so the goal of HD research has always been to stop the disease. But before we can stop the disease, we first had to understand the disease. And before we could understand the disease, we had to find what was causing the disease. So I'm gonna break my talk up into three separate parts today. The first is finding the gene which will allow for a better understanding of the gene, which everyone is hoping will lead to the third chapter in the saga, which is stopping the gene. We have known about Huntington's disease for centuries. And in fact, we've known it's hereditary since the late 1800s, but we haven't always known what was the cause of Huntington's. And so for a lot of families, what they knew was that if one of their parents had HD, they had a chance of inheriting it. They had a 50% chance. And that was true for the Wexler family, shown here. This is a picture of Nancy with her sister Alice, their father Milton, and their mother Leonor. And so ultimately, Leonor carried the gene for Huntington's, which meant that both Nancy and Alice had a 50% chance of developing HD. So like a lot of HD families, I know like me, um, that led them to have a whole lot of questions that they didn't have answers for. So they set out to do something about that. In 1968, the Wexler family led by Milton started the Hereditary Disease Foundation, and you are going to hear me call that the HDF. So the Wexler family and the HDF formed an unprecedented collaboration between all of the top HD research labs across the world. They felt if they could get everyone working together, it would be better than each lab individually trying to race against each other to try and find the gene. And so ultimately, it was Nancy that convinced everyone that they should be working together. Um, and what that did was it really meant that the competition was no longer individual labs trying to beat each other to find the gene, but it was everyone working together against the disease. So it really became, rather than the us against them mentality, it became the us against HD mentality. So the Wexler family developed an absolute collaborative force and led this world-class group of researchers to Venezuela starting in 1979. And that was because they found out about a very large family in the Lake Maracaibo region in Venezuela, where there were thousands of people that all had Huntington's disease. And so this group of researchers went to Venezuela so that they could meet these people because they felt if they could meet this family and talk to these people, if they could get blood samples or tissue samples from these people, they might finally be able to figure out what gene is causing Huntington's. And ultimately, from these excursions to Venezuela, that led to the gene hunters. And this was a group of six different labs that worked together for over a decade, trying to find the root cause of Huntington's. They created a pedigree, so a family chart of over 18,000 people that spanned 10 generations. This is an absolutely massive undertaking. And these researchers were looking for a single genetic similarity in all of these people. So to give you some perspective, the human genome contains about 25,000 genes. And these researchers were looking for a single gene that was common amongst all of those people 
based on this pedigree and based on the samples they collected. So that's like looking through 25,000 different books, trying to find a single sentence that's common amongst all of them with the same spelling error. That's a huge undertaking. And it took 10 years, but ultimately this was successful. It was from these excursions that were led by Nancy that these gene hunters were able to find the gene that causes HD. And that was really because of the help that the Venezuelan families provided. So recently, the original gene hunters spoke about this moment, the moment when they knew they had found the gene that causes HD. In 1993, when the, the gene was found, I remember exactly where I was. It was one of those, you know, like JFK moments. I was in the genetics office in Cardiff and, the, and somebody said, oh, there's people on the phone for you. They said, we've got the gene. Christine Ambrose came into my office with this autoradiogram, this piece of x-ray film that showed the triplet repeat on the HD chromosome. Marcy came in the door with an x-ray film that was still dripping wet and said, look, we knew we had it. And it was, oh my gosh, it's a triplet repeat. Running back into the lab and all of us getting together and just the excitement it's like, it actually happened. It's there. The gene's been found. The gene's been found. It's like, holy moly, holy moly. God, yeah, I was like blown away and it was the most exciting thing. After 10 years of trying to look for the gene, it also was a relief <laughs> at that point. Seeing that gel was the eureka moment. It just meant this collaboration had really worked. And so I hope you can feel that excitement, the excitement that those researchers felt. This was something they had been working on for over a decade, and they finally did it. You know, if you watch TV and you see science on TV, it leads you to believe you're having these eureka moments every day in the lab. But I can tell you from having worked at the bench, you are genuinely lucky if you have a few of these moments in your career. So they knew what was causing Huntington's. Uh, and now that they knew what was causing Huntington's, they could try to understand exactly what that genetic change was doing at the cellular and molecular level. Because in order to stop this gene, we first have to understand this gene. The gene hunters had discovered that the cause of HD is a triplet repeat. It's a sequence that repeats the same three letters, C-A-G, over and over. And what's interesting is we all have this gene. It's called the Huntington gene. And we even all have a CEG repeat within this gene. It's just that people who go on to develop Huntington's have more CEG repeats within this gene. And so ultimately, Huntington's is caused by a genetic stutter in a very specific region of the genetic code. And if someone has 40 or more CEGs, they will go on to develop HD if they live long enough. Once the researchers knew the genetic cause of HD, one of the first advancements that was made was the development of a genetic test that could tell if people conclusively had the gene that leads to HD. And the development of this test has led to many other advancements. So things like pre-implantation genetic testing or PGT, and that can be used in conjunction with in vitro fertilization to test embryos for HD. So after an embryo is fertilized, one cell is removed, tested for HD, and this allows babies to be born without Huntington's. So additionally, because researchers now knew the exact genetic cause of HD, they were able to map CAG repeat lengths of, with symptom onset. <clears throat> so with that, they were able to determine that the CAG repeat length correlated with the age that someone would start to show symptoms. So in general, the higher the CAG repeat, the younger someone is when they start to, start to show symptoms. And very high CAG repeat numbers, like those over 60, those tend to correlate with juvenile forms of the disease. I know of a case where someone had 180 CAGs and they eventually succumb to the effects of HD at the very young age of three. Conversely, there are people who are right at the threshold of disease, who have 40 CG repeats, and they may not develop symptoms until their 80s or 90s. And so Huntington's really is a disease that can span the entire breadth of the human lifespan. But most typically, what we see is that symptoms begin between the ages of 30 and 50. And in general, CG repeat length correlates with age of onset. But what the researchers noticed was that there's variability in this correlation. So two people can have the exact same number of CG repeats 
and begin to show symptoms at very different ages, almost a decade apart. So for example, two people can have 42 CEG repeats and one person starts to show symptoms in their 50s and another in their 60s. But why, why is this? Uh, the researchers know that CG repeat correlates with age of onset. So what is leading to this variability? And to answer this question, researchers next turn to um, animal models. Now that they knew what was causing HD, they could make models that mimic the symptoms of HD. And this allows them to really study Huntington's at a resolution that's just not possible in people. And so I have a mouse shown here because mice are very commonly used, not only in HD research, but science as a whole. Um, and there are various mouse models that exist in HD. There are really rapidly progressing mouse models that are symptomatic almost from birth and die from effects of the disease by the time they're 12 weeks, whereas a healthy mouse can live two years. There are also very slowly progressing mouse models. So researchers can pick which models they're interested in based on which questions they want to ask. And it's not just mice. There are lots of different animal models that have been created since the discovery of the gene. Um, there's cells, there's yeast, there's rats, there's worms, there's fruit flies, um, there's larger animal models, there's pigs, there's monkeys, there's sheep. I think the strangest two I can think of right now are sea urchins, and more recently plants have been used. So genuinely, if you can think it, a researcher has probably tried to answer some question about HD from it. Uh, and really what these animal, these all these different animal models allow for is for specific questions to be asked and answered to understand HD better at the cellular and molecular level. So it was with mouse models that researchers first noticed something interesting. They noticed that the CEG repeat was getting bigger over time. In mice that were specifically designed to express a very specific CEG repeat length, they noticed after those animals died, the CEG repeat was much larger than they thought it would be. And this is because something called somatic instability. So it's an instability of the CEG repeat tract in somatic cells or cells of the body. So for example, the most common CEG repeat length in someone with HD is 42, but there could be expansions of up to a thousand CEG repeats in some cells before those cells die. That person will still have 42 CEG repeats. Whether they're 18 or 50, if you test their blood, they'll still have 42 CG repeats. But in some cells, before those cells die, those CG repeats get enormous. And it's this biological phenomenon of somatic instability that's really been one of the hottest topics in HD research for the past several years. But what was interesting is that the researchers found that this, this was specifically happening in areas of the brain that were known to be vulnerable in HD and in the cell types that are vulnerable. So in Huntington's, what we very typically see is uh, an atrophy of the cortical layer, so the outermost portion of the brain, and a shrinking of the striatum. So this is the very center of your brain, essentially. And what they noticed was that um, the, the most vulnerable cells in these regions are a cell type called neurons, they're brain cells. Those are the cells that help us think and move and feel. And these brain cells in these specific regions of the brain were the ones that the researchers noticed have these really long CEG expansions. And so, as all good scientists do, they again asked why, why is this? What is causing these really massive expansions? And could this have something to do with the variability in age of onset that they saw? And so to answer this question, researchers turned to samples from lots and lots of HD families. Over 4,000 people donated samples for a study called GEMHD. And the people in the study analyzed the entire genetic makeup of each one of these people because they wanted to use these samples to try and understand if they could understand what is contributing to variation in age of onset and if that plays a role in um, somatic instability. And what they found was something called modifiers. So I'll explain that. So they found the answer in these little changes that exist in our DNA that makes each of us unique, that these changes that make us us. And so, for example, even though we all may have the genetic code for eyes, some of us have brown eyes, some of us have blue eyes, and every shade in between. But those tiny little changes that make our eyes unique, that make us unique, they don't just exist in the genes that code for our eyes. They exist in every gene in our body. And so what the researchers were able to ask with this data set is what other little changes that make people unique do these people with HD have that might be contributing to earlier or later onset? And those other genes, those other tiny changes that make us unique, those are the modifiers. They can modify when symptoms of HD appear. 
And what the scientists found was that those little changes are specifically in a set of genes that control something called DNA repair. And this is the exact biological process that would control somatic instability. So that perpetual expansion of the CG repeat. And so these DNA repair genes help regulate spelling of the genetic code. You can think of them like little molecular proofreaders. They make sure there are no extra letters added or removed in the genetic code. But those tiny little changes that make us unique, that make us us, um, they can also happen in our DNA repair genes. And that might make them proofread a little worse or a little better. So someone that has the gene for HD, who has a good DNA repair gene, they might be born with 42 CG repeats that expand very little over their life. And that might allow for them to have later onset. But someone that has the gene for HD that has a tiny change in their DNA repair genes, that might make them proofread a little bit more poorly um, so that their CG repeat gets a little bit bigger over time. So if a molecular mistake occurs and there's an extra CG repeat added, instead of correcting it, the proofreader lets it slide through. And that causes the repeat to get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And so it's because those DNA repair genes aren't proofreading as well that causes this molecular stutter to grow over time. And that could cause earlier onset. Since the gene hunters found the gene that causes HD, we now have a much better understanding about what this gene is doing, both at the cellular and the molecular level. We now know that the CG repeat length correlates with age of onset. We know that there's variability in this age of onset, even with the same CG repeat length number. We know that this biological phenomenon of somatic instability causes that CG repeat length to grow over time, particularly in very vulnerable cell types like the cells in the brain. And we know that DNA repair genes, those little molecular proofreaders, seem to be really critical for this process. So all of these advancements that have followed the finding of the gene are really what have led us now to the age of clinical trials. In the past 10 years, we have finally seen come to the clinic clinical trials with the goal of stopping the gene and modifying disease course. Honestly, before then, almost every single trial was designed at bettering symptoms of HD, but not truly modifying when or even if someone might start developing HD. So if you had gone to a scientific conference maybe five or 10 years ago, 100% of the people there were researchers. They were people that were working in the lab every day. They were trying to understand Huntington's, what the gene is doing, how it's affecting cells and systems. If you go to a, an HD scientific conference today, there's a very strong representation from pharmaceutical companies, and many of those companies are pursuing drugs that they think are going to modify disease course. So right now, you're seeing names of different pharmaceutical companies populate the slide. These are all companies that have either had a presence at an HD conference, they have made a public commitment to working on HD, or they have an ongoing trial right now for Huntington's. We are truly living in the age of clinical trials and HD research. And many of these companies that are interested in HD are focused on developing disease-modifying treatments. So I know I've placed a lot of emphasis on disease-modifying treatments, but there are also still companies that are working on drugs that will better symptoms um, because improving the quality of life of someone living with HD is really important as well. It can have a huge impact. And so there are companies like Sage Therapeutics that's working on Sage 718 that's designed to uh, improve cognitive function that's currently in trials. Uh, last year, we found out there was FDA approval of neurochrome biosciences drug Ingreza, which is used to improve chorea. So these can have a really big impact on people living with HD. Um, but all of this to say that this is a really rich space. We have lots of companies that are working on various aspects of HD, not only trying to better symptoms, but also trying to modify disease course. And so one of the approaches that companies are taking that are trying to modify disease course is something called Huntington lowering. But before we can talk about these trials, before we talk about Huntington lowering, we first need a very brief review of biology. So I will take you back to your high school bio 101, and we will cover the central dogma of molecular biology. So we all have genes, and those genes are transcribed into message something called messenger RNA or mRNA, which you very likely heard of in the era of COVID. And that message is translated into protein. Your protein is the functional unit of your cell. That is what gets stuff done. Huntington-lowering drugs work by degrading the message. Without the message, you have no protein. 
So the gene is not changed. The genetic makeup of the individual remains the same. It's just the message is degraded, so there is no protein. So there are a lot of companies that have their eggs in this Huntington lowering basket, and they're using various approaches. The approach that was taken first is something called an ASO or antisense oligonucleotide. So this is delivered um, to the cerebrospinal fluid that bathes the brain. So directly to the spinal column using a lumbar puncture. Um, there are several companies using this approach. Uh, there are also companies exploring small molecules. So these can be taken as a pill, which is exciting. And there are also companies that are looking at viral gene therapy. So these would be delivered directly to the brain using brain surgery. So one of the first companies I want to highlight is Wave Therapeutics. They have an allele selective approach, which means they're only targeting the expanded copy of Huntington. They currently have a phase one, two trial going on, and we are expecting to hear more data from them in quarter two of 2024, so this year. Vico Therapeutics also has an ASO that's allele selective, but what's exciting about their approach is that it targets the CEG repeat. Um, and Huntington's is not the only CG repeat disease. So if it works for one of these CG repeat diseases, it's thought that it could have benefits for others. Um, so they have an ongoing phase one, two study that is expected to be complete in September of 2025. And the last company I want to highlight here is Roche. And they really led the field um, in ASOs and Huntington lowering drugs, testing their drug Tominersen. They were the first out of the gate and they made it to a phase three trial for Tominersen. But we very unfortunately learned in March of 2021 that that trial was being halted. So an independent safety review committee, not affiliated with Roche, not affiliated with the trial, they reviewed the data and they determined that it was no longer safe for people to stay in that trial, that people being given the drug may be doing worse than those being given placebo. But Roche did their due diligence. They went through all of the data from that trial. And what they found when they did a post hoc analysis is that maybe a subset of people in that trial that had less pronounced symptoms that were being given a lower dose of the drug less frequently may have been doing better. And so um, they're doing the right thing now. They're going back and they're testing that hypothesis in a phase two trial that is set to complete January of 2025. That's called Generation HD2. And so while it was obviously very understandably incredibly disappointing to have this trial halted there is still scientific reason to believe that if we can find the right dose in the right population, given the right interval, um, it could have some benefit. PTC Therapeutics is testing their drug PTC 518. Um, so this is taking us a pill to lower Huntington, it's something called a splice modulator. So it basically works by rearranging the message of Huntington. The cell sees that makes no sense, so it doesn't bother making the protein. Um, they have a phase two trial ongoing that's expected to be complete in July of this year, so 2024. Um, and last, I want to mention Unicure. So they have a viral gene therapy delivered straight to the brain. Um, they are in a phase one, two trial. This is a long-term follow-up because obviously brain surgery is a pretty intense mode of delivery. So this is they're taking a very conservative route, low number of people, long-term follow-up. There's a five-year follow-up for this study, so it's expected to be complete in June of 2029, um, but they're sharing data along the way when they can. So Unicure shared some very exciting data about AMT-130 um, just at the end of last year, so in December, uh, which I want to go over. So the trial by Unicure is designed to look at how safe and well-tolerated AMT-130 is in people with HD. And AMT-130 is a drug that's delivered using a harmless virus. And this virus contains instructions, genetic instructions, to tell the cell to make a little piece of genetic information. <clears throat> and what happens is the virus goes into the cell and the cell uses its own machinery to make that genetic information. So once the virus is in, the cell can just keep making it. You don't keep have to adding the virus. Um, and so what that little piece of genetic information does is it lowers the message, which means the protein isn't produced. And so this little harmless virus with that genetic instruction is delivered directly to the brain. So six injections directly to the striatum, uh, which is that innermost part of the brain that's most affected in HD. Um, and this is obviously a very intense mode of delivery. It doesn't get more intense than brain surgery, uh, but it's also designed to be a one and done. So once it's there, it's there. You, It's a treatment for life. 
Um, there's no going back though. So that's for better or worse, which means there's obvious pros and cons to this, right? The pro is that it means people just need to do this one time and hopefully there will be a lifelong treatment. The con is that if there are negative effects, those may not get better. So this is understandably being rolled out slowly. This study is currently being conducted in the US and Europe, and they're testing two doses, a high dose and a low dose. And it's small. Like I said, there's only 39 people in this whole trial. Um, and that's by design because this really is a high risk, high reward type of approach. But in December, just a few weeks ago in December, they released some data from this trial that I want to talk about. And so this was after 30 months of people taking this, of being injected after the surgery. So even though this trial is designed to look at safety and tolerability, they're also looking at other metrics. So things that assess the people's function, um, their brain volume and different biomarkers. And the take home so far is that AMT-130 is generally safe and well tolerated. And in their December presentation, they also shared data that seems to suggest that AMT-130 is having a positive effect on functional tests. So they looked at things like total functional capacity. And this is a, a, a test that measures um, the ability of someone to hold a job, to do their own finances, to um, perform domestic chores, carry out acts of daily living, and assesses how much care they need from someone else. They looked at total motor score, which looks at both uh, voluntary and involuntary movements. They assess true board reading test and sing symbol digit modality test. So these look at processing speed, attention, and memory. So on all of these different functional tests that are designed to look at disease progression, the data seem to suggest that people taking AMT-130 had an improvement compared to people not taking the drug. And this is honestly, this is a really big deal. This is the first time ever that any drug that's being tested on HD in people has shown that it can alter symptoms of Huntington's. However, um, before everyone starts jumping up and down, uh, I wanna remind everyone, this is a very small study with fewer than 40 people. It is primarily designed to look at safety and tolerability. So at the end of the day, at the end of this trial, they will be able to conc conclusively say if AMT-130 is safe or not. They will not conclusively be able to say if AMT-130 is having a positive effect on HD. To do that, they will have to run a larger trial with more people. However, <laughs> what they can do is they can look at this data they've collected on function um, and they can get an idea about the effect that AMT-130 may be having. And so far, it seems very encouraging. Um, but that excitement really does have to be tempered with the knowledge that this is a small trial uh, designed to look at safety. So the take home basically is that overall exciting, but don't celebrate just yet. So I just emphasized Huntington lowering drugs um, because I think it's, um, it's exciting to have trials that are going after the direct cause of what we know is causing HD. But I also want to highlight some of the other potential treatments that could be disease modifying, but aren't geared toward Huntington lowering. And so one of those is by Anexon Biosciences. They have a drug called ANX005, and this is given uh, intravenously, so an IV straight to the arm. It is not designed to target Huntington in any way. It's basically designed to just keep your brain cells healthier. And so um, in our brain, what we have, our neurons have these tiny little feet that come very close together. They don't quite touch, but they're very, very close. And that tiny space between them is called the synapse. And the way that our brain cells communicate is they send these bubbles of information back and forth to each other. In HD, that communication breaks down over time. So cells can't send and receive this information as well. When they can't communicate, they're not as healthy. When they're not as healthy, they can die. So the way ANX005 works is they think it will help maintain that line of communication. If you can keep that open, if you might be able to keep the cells healthier, make them live longer, and hopefully stave off symptoms of HD. So in Exxon, um, it's currently testing this drug. They're hoping to start a phase three in 2024, so this year. I also want to highlight um, some of the preclinical work that's being done on genes that are involved in somatic instability, so that perpetual expansion of the CG repeat. And so these studies are only in mice right now, but I want to highlight them because they are headed toward the clinic, and you are very likely to hear about some of these in the not-so-distant future. And it's going to sound like a bowl of alphabet soup. These are things like FAN1 and MLH1 and MSH3 and 
uh, PMS-1. So lots of different letters that maybe you haven't heard of before, but they are coming to the clinic. And I want to showcase these because it's these types of studies, those that are currently being done in mice that really help feed that clinical trial pipeline. And it's this basic research that later translates into those trials that I've talked about today. So even with all of the current trials going on, the pace in re of HD research absolutely has not slowed. Um, honestly, if anything, it's only gained momentum. And that's because the field is going to continue to work like there's no treatment until we have one in hand that's FDA approved. And after that, researchers will work to improve that treatment. So HD research is always ongoing so that we have ideas to feed that clinical trial pipeline. First, get a treatment, and then to improve that treatment. To do that, basic research needs funding. And a primary way to make sure basic research exists to feed that clinical trial pipeline is to give to organizations like the HDF. Our sole mission is to find and fund promising research that will lead to treatments for HD. We do that not only by funding research, but also by supporting researchers and HD families. We have these webinars, so kudos to you for finding them and being here. Uh, these are free, they're online. Please share them with everyone you know. It's a great format for researchers to share their work with the community. We also host conferences every other year. We have a scientific conference that gets everyone together, researchers together, and allows them to share their work in person with everyone else in the field. We host workshops, which are small format meetings about a very specific topic. We get the world leading experts on that topic together and try and figure out how we can use that to move the HT needle forward. And so last November, uh, November of 2023, a few months ago, we revived HDF workshops after a brief pause. And this included a workshop specifically focused on our young investigators. And it's because these, these people are the future of HD research. So we have our HDF funded young investigators shown here with two of the original gene hunters. We were joined on the last day by Dr. Nancy Wexler and Dr. David Hausman. That was fantastic for our young investigators. And of course, we also fund grants. Uh, we have our annual awards. We have research grants and postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, they're both for $100,000 a year. Grants are for one year. Postdoctoral fellowships are for two. And in the last five years, we've been able to award $7.5 million with this funding mechanism. In 2023, we supported 13 projects. And these covered a variety of different subjects in HD. So looking at things like modifiers, somatic stability, using artificial intelligence to speed the discovery of HD research, um, assessing biomarkers that can be used to track clinical progression. So really exciting projects. And we will be announcing the awardees for our 2024 program in early spring. In 2023, we were really excited to announce the Transformative Research Award Program. So this is a much larger grant of a million dollars that's given over two years. We were very happy to award two teams with a transformative research award in 2023, one led by Dr. Beverly Davidson and another by Dr. Ricardo Moropinto. So both teams will be sharing their work in a webinar later this year. So stay tuned so you can learn more about what those projects are. And if you're a researcher on the call, um, pop out your calendar because our 2024 funding round opened uh, just a few days ago in January. So LOIs are now open. And if you are really excited about HD research and you'd like to hear about the latest and greatest, sometimes it's just confusing and it's over your head, I highly recommend that you go to hdbuzz at hdbuzz.net. This is a website that is about HD research and news. It's written by HD researchers in plain language. I very proudly serve as a writer and editor for HD Buzz, and I always re recommend that HD families go here for their news because research is complicated um, and HD is very hard. So if you need support and a community to lean on, there are also really great support organizations in the HD space. The HD Youth Organization, HDEO, is an organization specifically focused on young people in the HD community, um, supporting them, educating them, and empowering them. Huntington's Disease Society of America, or HDSA, which hopefully everyone on this call has heard of, they are a fantastic organization. They're dedicated to improving the lives of everyone affected by HD, and they have various support groups across the country. And if you want to do something, if you want to participate in research, you can go to HDSA's HD Trial Finder. You can learn more about HD trials that might be right for you or your family. This allows you to specifically search for HD trials that are in your area that you might be a match for. So this is a really great resource for anyone who wants to participate in research. 
But I realize participating in clinical trials can be daunting, or maybe you want to participate, but you aren't symptomatic, or maybe you don't want to know your gene status. Or maybe you know your gene status and you're negative, but you still want to get involved. The answer is you can. Um, you can still participate in research. So there are observational studies like Enroll HD that are strictly observational. So no drug is given. They're essentially designed to just follow people as they live and as they age and see how that compares to people who are living with HD. Currently, there are over 21,000 participants and in this study at 157 sites from 23 countries. This is massive participation from a patient community. It's honestly almost unheard of in other diseases. Um, but it's information from studies like this that have tons of participation from the patient community that allowed the gene hunters to discover the gene that causes HD and allowed um, them to discover somatic instability is playing a role in HD pathology. And I can tell you data sets from Enroll HD are being used every day in research to bring new findings. Um, there are papers being published every day from Enroll HD. So if you're in Enroll HD, you're contributing to HD research. And that's really all of this. It's the generation of these very large data sets from HD families, this collaboration among scientists and between scientists and families that was really spearheaded by the vision of Nancy, the Wexler family, and the gene hunters. And the HD field is continuing that collaborative spirit today. It's still everyone is working together against a common goal, and we really still do share the mentality of us against HD. So this is why I feel like we really are at the beginning of the end. We truly are at the precipice of stopping the gene. And that's because of the collaboration within the scientific community and between the researchers and the HD families. It's because of that that we now have these huge data sets that we can learn so much from. And it's because of the the explosion of clinical trials that we've seen, even with the setbacks with the Huntington Loring trials in 2021, the fact that we now have trials in the clinic that are aimed not just at treating symptoms, but disease modifying treatments, like maybe to determine when or maybe if someone gets it, that's huge. These are huge. I feel like even five years ago, this seems like we're standing at the doorsteps of, of stopping the gene, but it's not over until it's over. And until it is, scientists will keep working toward a treatment and then a better treatment and then a better way to deliver that treatment, which is why it's so important to support research, both by participating in trials and also giving to organizations that support research. So I encourage all of you to connect with HDF, tell your friends, tell your family. Um, you can go to our website and get on our mailing list. If you're not already, you should do it today right after the webinar. Um, you can connect with us on the socials sign up for our webinars for the rest of the year so you can see me again and learn about some amazing HD research uh, and just stay connected. So I am very happy to answer questions that anyone may have now. Um, if you sent those in in the Q&A box, keep sending those in and I will try to get to as many as I can. Um, I usually kind of go through the questions during the acknowledgements, but I've not had that chance yet. So I think I'll just start at the top. <clears throat> ah. So this is a question from Igor. FDA recently approved a CRISPR treatment for sickle cell, a, a, a recent new enzyme that has been potential target to 100% of human GMO. How long do you think CRISPR will take to be available for HD? Are we still a lifetime away? So um, I might defer this to our group who is speaking next month. That will be the Transformative Research Award team led by Dr. Ricardo Moropinto. He's using CRISPR therapies. Um, and he's using them to specifically target genes involved in somatic instability. So that perpetual expansion of the CD repeat. I don't think we're a lifetime away. I don't think it's happening tomorrow. Um, what I would say about the treatment for sickle cell is that it also involves stem cells. So it's, it's a bit of a complex treatment that they're using for sickle cell. It won't have a large rollout. Um, it's not to say it's not an advancement. I don't think any treatment for a disease that's the first will be the last. Uh, but I do think we're moving toward that. So Igor, definitely sign up for next month's webinar and you'll learn a lot more about CRISPR treatments for HD. This is a question from Eugene Huddy. Did anyone see the CBS show 60 Minutes this past Sunday, January 14th? Neurologist in Morgantown, West Virginia um, learned how to penetrate the blood-brain barrier, which enables him to insert directly into the area of the brain drugs, which reduce the plaque of the affected area. Someone from HDF needs to contact him. Um, 
I don't know him or his work. Maybe he's working in Alzheimer's based on the use of the word plaque, but there are a lot of people that are working on blood brain benefit blood brain barrier penetration in HD. Uh, we actually funded someone named Dr. Nick Todd, who's working on ultrasound to improve blood brain barrier penetration to get drugs into the brain for uh, for Huntington's patients. Um, there's also quite a bit of work on the blood brain barrier in HD to show that there is increased penetration. So we might not necessarily need to increase the blood brain barrier permeability, but we could take advantage of what we already know about the blood brain barrier permeability metrics in HD. Um, but that's great. I'll, I'll look up this person's work. Uh, when will PTC 518 be approved? I don't know. <laughs> I'm watching that trial very eagerly. Um, they obviously have a little bit more work to do. Um, but what's nice, what's really nice about PTC for folks that don't know, so this is the one that's taken as a pill. Um, it's it's a daily treatment. It's taken as a pill. It's a Huntington lowering drug, so it gets right at the the cause of HD, and it it washes out from the body. It's it's not something that will stay in you forever. So if you start to have some unexpected effect from this, you in theory can stop taking the drug, and it will go away. Um, I don't know when it will be approved. It has to go through the FDA regulatory process. They are marching their way forward, though, and they're they're I think they're doing pretty well. So I'm I'm certainly watching that eagerly as well. Do we have a date for the AMT 130 regulator meeting and will it get approved early? Um, I'm not entirely sure I know what you mean by the regulator meeting. They just had a meeting for their investors in December. They're expecting to release more data in quarter two of 2024. So usually when they say that, it's at the end of quarter two. So probably um, sometime around June, I should expect more. Um, will it get approved early? they're going to need to test that more people. They're not going to approve AMT-130 based on that current trial. So there will be another trial for AMT-130. <clears throat> um, again, Igor, it seems like in the last two or three years, every month there's a new finding about HD functionality and a possible avenue of treatment. The research about HD increased exponentially, but the findings are not yet in clinical trials. MSH3, FAN1, uh, what um, as a community can we really do to make things move faster? It's really a mix of hope and frustration to see all the new information, but also seeing how slow things move in terms of trials. I agree. I mean, I think we all wish science moved faster, but I think we have to be cautious that we don't push science too fast. We want to make sure these things are safe, and we want to make sure these things work before we really roll it out to everyone. Um, I think a lot of the th these things are moving toward clinical trials as far as MSH3, FAN1, you know, we didn't really know what these modifiers were doing, that they were having this massive impact on somatic instability until a few years ago. Um, and I think also we have to be cautious, in particular with somatic instability related genes that are controlling that, because DNA repair genes can also regulate cancer. So you specifically mentioned MSH3, that's a major regulator of colon cancer. We want to make sure that we're not treating Huntington's and giving people cancers that we don't have modalities for, right? So maybe we could treat colon cancer, but if that spreads to the brain, then you might have brain cancer. Um, so I do hear you that there's a lot of hope, but also frustration. Um, but I, I think people are going as fast as they can so that we know things are safe before we roll it out, because we really do want to make sure, number one, they're safe, and number two, that they work before we let people start taking these. Have scientists fixed rising HD levels with AMT 130 HD levels? I'm not sure I understand what you mean, Hannah. Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. I know they tested, one of the biomarkers that they tested was for mutant Huntington. That certainly didn't rise. It, it didn't show much of an effect. It didn't really go down much either, but I, from what I understand, it didn't rise. Maybe we could connect by email and I could help you answer that. What is the function of the CEG repeats within the normal Huntington protein? Michael O'Neill. This is a good question. Um, the CEG repeats specifically, I don't know, but uh, I could talk a little bit about various aspects of this. So we actually don't even entirely know all of the functions of the normal. So we call it the wild type Huntington protein. It does a lot of stuff though. Um, what's interesting is that it's a huge protein and really big proteins tend to do a lot of things. What um, research has shown is the CG repeats are interesting because, so there's work by Dr. Elena Cataneo from Italy, 
that show she looks at the cg repeat she looks at huntington in so many different species and what she finds is that the cg repeats kind of tend to get longer and higher order mammals people are the only species that gets huntington's disease so it's really thought that the huntington protein and cg repeats can also contribute to um iq so you know if you have more cg repeats chances are you're super smart um and that's also work by pegnopolis dr pegnopolis from iowa uh, there's been a correlation between increasing siege repeat and um, IQ. So it's thought that maybe it controls cognitive function and it contributes to um, intelligence. Um, do we know the function of the normal Huntington protein? Some, not all. So it really, it, that's a lot of different functions. So it plays a role in, um, we think, DNA damage. It can... Um, it binds a lot of different proteins. It's a cofactor. It's required for brain development early on. If you completely knock it out of mice before they're born, they're never born. So it's required for brain development. Uh, we're still learning. So the answer is we know some, we don't know all of what the wild type protein does. How far has Jackson Laboratory got as far as HD research? Um, that I don't know. Maybe again, Hannah, we could connect offline with that. I'm not familiar with specific HD research projects that the Jax Lab has going. I know they make a lot of HD mice. Um, and then another question from Hannah, will ultrasound be used for HD? I mentioned Nick Todd's work before. He's using, he's looking at ultrasound to maybe open the blood brain barrier um, for short times for bursts to get drugs into the brain. Uh, so it could be used for that purpose. Anton Reiner, at what HD stage did the AMT-130 treatments begin? That is a fantastic question that I don't know off of the top of my head. Um, but if you email me, Anton, I can certainly try to find you that information and we can connect about, um, about that offline. So Gil Omen, what kinds of results were obtained in animal models by Unicare that led to the clinical study you described? Uh, they had a lot. And so, uh, so Unicare did a lot of animal work before they moved into people. So they started in mice, but I think you know, their most notable and most exciting work that led to their human trials was done in a mini pig model. And they're called mini pigs, but they're actually quite, quite big. Um, and the reason they used mini pigs is because their brains are very similar, are much more similar to people than mice. Mice just have these kind of smooth brains that kind of look like a little jelly bean. Um, they don't have the invagination that the human cortex has, but uh, pigs do. And so pigs' brains are much more similar. And so they had quite a bit of preclinical work in the pig models that showed when they were given AMT-130, the um, mutant Huntington levels went down. Um, so there was biomarker tracking and all sorts of evidence that suggested that they should move into people. Uh, Amy Johnson, is there any research being conducted to study the effects of healthier diets on severity of symptoms, such as the Mediterranean diet? Um, I don't believe there's anything being done in people. There is quite a bit of evidence to show that the healthier you are, both through diet and exercise and healthy lifestyle, um, the better you fare. So there was a study, I think this was published by Pegnopolis, looking at the Enroll HD data set, and they looked at alcohol consumption, tobacco consumption, drug use, um, and showed that all of those things kind of potentiate symptoms of HD. So again, the Enroll data set being used um, for findings in HD, but no one has specifically looked at very specific diets. Um, there have been specific diets looked at in mice. There was recently a paper that showed that high fiber diets, the amount of fiber in your diet affects mice. Again, this is mice, <laughs> um, but it's interesting. So people are looking at it in mice and there is a lot of evidence to suggest that a healthy diet, a healthy lifestyle, exercise can keep you healthy. If you're healthy, your brain's healthy and it helps you live a better life longer. Um, Ryan Van Dyke, any updates on Dr. Goldman's glial cell study? Uh, and then he sent me a neuroscience news. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of one, but maybe Ryan, we could connect via email offline. Uh, Michael O'Neill, is there evidence that the pathogenic CG repeat leads to the formation of double-stranded RNAs that precipitate the innate immune system leading to damage? Wow, that is a very specific question. Um, I unfortunately don't have an answer to that. That is outside the realm of my expertise. But if you send me an email with that question, I will very happily try to find an answer for you. And I'm, I, I have my homework cut out for me because I can read about um, the immune system interaction with RNA because that is not my area of expertise. Um, Hannah Beasley, what does PTC 518 do? 
Um, so PVC 518 is a splice modulator and it, it's a Huntington lowering drug. So you take it, it's a pill. You take it, I believe once a day is what they're testing. They might be testing multiple concentrations and it's a, a splice modulator. So essentially it takes the message of Huntington and the way that, that genetics work is we have these little codes and they code for little protein building blocks. And there's always one that has a stop code on, we call it. And it tells the cellular machinery like, oh, you can stop now and you pop off and then that's done. You know, it's finished. It's baked. Um, what the splice modulator does is it takes that stop code on and moves it up in the sequence. So it's not the entire sequence and it gets to that stop code on and everything pops off and the cell sees that that's not the entire protein. That doesn't make any sense that this is just like a little truncated form of what I wanted to make. So it doesn't make the protein. Um, so that is <laughs> hopefully a, a logical way of explaining a splice modulator. Um, Igor, I hope HDF is also worried about the treatments being funded with the help of the community are going to be accessible and widely available. My fear is I will not be able to possibly fund through. Yes. Um, I think, you know, pharmaceutical companies by nature, they're for-profit companies, but they're not going to sell any drug that is out of the realm of purchase power of people that have a disease they're trying to treat. It is certainly a question that I've heard asked at many a scientific conference. And I think um, the HD community is really lucky and the researchers that we have, because this is something that they're asking to pharmaceutical companies. We certainly don't want to get to the point where we have a treatment in hand and no one can take it because it's too expensive. Um, so yes, that is something that people are certainly thinking of. Uh, Ryan Van Dyke, any thoughts on doing predictability or predictable quarterly updates like this with the community HDSA, HDF form about patient trial questions to be answered? That is a great idea. Um, yeah, we can certainly think about doing that. I think we can probably draw on a few organizations like you mentioned. And um, yeah, that would be great. We also have a clinical trial update coming later this year for our webinars that will be given by uh, Dr. Frank Bennett from Ionis, as well as Dr. Ed Wild from University College London that I think people are really going to like. So that should be a, kind of a global view of clinical trials going on in this space and might satisfy that question, Ryan. Uh, Ryan Van Dyke, Ohio is working on CRISPR to get here in five years and $22 million study. I've asked what amount of money it will take to get two years to save lives. Would it be less costly than the billions? Yeah, so one of the things is that there's not a lot of, studies that are done to find kind of the the social cost of diseases like hd i tried to do a report myself honestly about it and i think it was 2018 because i was working with um like a local kind of charity in california and there just wasn't the research on it and so i tried to figure it out myself but um yeah i i think it's a it's a great idea and maybe that's something that some of these really big bankroll kind of private scientific funders like Chan Zuckerberg Institute or um, one of those would be interested in trying to fund. But yeah, I agree. It's something that we have to weigh. What is the societal cost versus the monetary cost of getting these treatments out sooner? Kenneth Gross, can you comment on symptom modification in HD with these new drugs, not the approved one for Korea, dementia and suicidality in HD? Um, and not the approved ones. So maybe some that are coming through clinical trials you're talking about. Unfortunately, um, I don't know every medication that's either out there for symptoms that's either approved or not approved. I am not a clinician. So I probably should have started this entire talk with this caveat. Uh, I am not qualified to give medical advice. I do not have a clinical degree. Um, so I think Kenneth, for your question, my advice would be to speak to a neurologist or someone who really knows what's out there as far as clinical trials um, for symptoms, what's coming down the pipeline, and also those that are also FDA approved, because they would have a much better understanding of those than I would. So an anonymous attendee, why does Alzheimer's have a treatment already since it's more complex than HD? Um, so as far as I know, I am certainly not as up on the Alzheimer's literature as I am HD. The treatment for Alzheimer's very recently approved. It's not necessarily like a one size fits all thing. Um, the other thing about Alzheimer's is it affects many more people. There are many more researchers working on it. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say um, Alzheimer's is more complex than HD. I think they're both incredibly complex diseases. Um, 
So I think um, maybe if you're comfortable anonymous attendee emailing me, I can help you kind of tease through some of what's known about Alzheimer's and the treatments that are available compared to what we have for HD, um, because I think they're both equally complex, but there is certainly a difference in what is what type of monetary contributions are put into both of those diseases. Anonymous, are there recent findings on somatic instability and DNA repair issues applicable to JHD? Can the potential clinical trials and results be applicable to the JHD community? Um, this is a great question, and I don't know this. So the JHD community, juvenile onset HD community, um, it's tough because it's it's hard to run clinical trials for juvenile forms of a disease. Um, and I don't think that we currently know the answers to some of those questions. Um, so I think someone that will be a really good resource to get in touch with for questions about juvenile onset HD, there's the join HD, um, that will be a really good resource. And then also HD Yo would have some really good resources for JHD, um, particularly regarding maybe um, what clinical trials have been applicable to that community. Uh, so I'm kind of trying to be cognizant of the time as well. Um, I think I'm going to call it there. If you had a question that I didn't get to, I am more than happy to follow up with you offline. If you didn't put your email address in, if you're willing to email me, that would be fantastic. Um, and you can find my email address if you go to the HDF website. My email address is there. I'm very happy to connect with anyone at any time if you have any questions. So I want to end by thanking everyone who has donated to the HDF to support the research that we fund. And to all of you for tuning in. Um, this has been great. Our next webinar is Thursday, February 22nd. And we will feature the work of one of our 2023 Transformative Research Award winners. So Dr. Ricardo Moro Pinto will be joined by others on his team to talk about his work using CRISPR for Huntington's disease drug development. So please stay tuned for more details about that. Thank you all so much for joining us and I hope to see you next time.